Well, thanks everyone for coming tonight and uh, for being here at tonight's event. My name is Kevin and I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the many events we're looking forward to is Patrick Radden Keith uh, this Thursday night in conversation with Lydia Paul Green about his book, Empire of Pain, The Secret History of the Sackler Dynasty. It, if you don't already do so, please consider following us on social media and keep up with all of our events coming up. Tonight, we are so excited to welcome Paula McLean and Sue Monk Kidd. Paula McLean is the New York Times bestselling author of four novels, including The Paris Wife, as well as a memoir and two collections of poetry. McLean's new novel, When the Stars Go Dark, is an atmospheric story of intertwined destinies and heart-wrenching suspense, starring Anna, David, uh, Anna Hart, a seasoned missing persons detective in San Francisco with far too much knowledge of the darkest side of human nature. When tragedy strikes her personal life, Anna flees to the Northern California village of Mendocino to grieve. After living there as a child with her beloved foster parents, she now believes it might be the only place left for her. Yet the day she arrives, she learns a local teenage girl has gone missing. The crime feels frighteningly reminiscent of the most crucial time in Anna's childhood, when the unsolved murder of a young girl touched Mendocino and change the community forever. As part, as past and present collide, Anna realizes that she has been led to this moment, weaving together actual cases of missing persons, trauma theory, and a hint of the metaphysical. McLean's propulsive, propulsive and deeply effective new novel tells a story of fate, necessary redemption, and what it takes when the worst happens to reclaim our lives and our faith in one another. She's joining us tonight from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank Joining you. McLean in conversation this evening is Sue Monk Kidd. She is the, the award-winning number one best-selling of, author of the novels, The Secret Lives, uh, The Secret Life of Bees, The Mermaid Chair, The Invention of Wings, and her newest, The Book of Longings, which is now available in paperback. Her books have been adapted for film and stage and have been translated into 36 languages. She joins us from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and we thank her for being with us. This evening's event will include an audience Q&A. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please feel free to upvote uh, by clicking the thumbs up button on that question. More importantly, please consider supporting Paula and Powell's by purchasing a copy of her new book from us. Here it is. There'll be a link to buy it <laughs> when the stars go dark, as well as Sue's book in paperback. And that'll pop up in the chat uh, a couple of times this evening. Paula, Sue, it's uh, such a pleasure to welcome you. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting us. And thank you, Sue, for agreeing to be my lovely moderator for this evening. I, um, I just absolutely loved your latest book. I mean, I've admired your work for years and years, but I think this new novel is extraordinary. And I just wanna say that I think that you took a great risk with this book in choosing Anna as a speaker and the subject matter that you did. And the result is absolutely transcendent. So it's a beautiful accomplishment and just bravo. It's wonderful. Thank you, Paula, that's very nice of you. Well, let me say how thrilled I am to be able to be in conversation with you tonight. Um, when the stars go dark, I loved it, Paula. I just, loved, I just loved reading it. I couldn't put it Thank down. Thank you. Yay. Um, it's, I mean, it's as Kevin was saying, it's this literary thriller, kind of a heart throbbing page turner literary thriller. I think of it as a literary thr thriller. It's, it's so much beyond that too for me. When I read it, um, I experienced the book as this. Um, 
gripping plot for one thing, Thank but you. also as a really resonant character exploration um, of the childhood woundedness of um, Anna Hart, Detective Anna Hart, mm -hmm. and her saving, if not obsessive need, career of searching for missing children. Right. Um, absolutely fascinating and floating kind of all through the plot beneath the lines in between the words for me was this dance between um, trauma and hope, trauma and hope. And also a kind of dance between what we search for and what we find, not just out there, literally, but in the human soul. So I just found it very compelling. And that is just so <laughs> beautifully said. I, you know, it's, uh... It's what I meant to do. So I feel very understood. Thank you. Well, you certainly accomplished it. And I know Kevin gave us a nice little summation of yeah. the story, but yeah. if you would like to give us a thumbnail of the story or tell us about your character and a heart to give us some context before we really dig in. Yeah, I'll tell you just a little bit more about Anna since Kevin did sort of give us the the description of the book and just explain a little bit more about this idea that I re weave in real missing persons cases. So as you know, I've been working in historical fiction for the last 10 years and, and more than just historical fiction, biographical historical fiction, taking real women from history and speaking in their voices and animating their stories. And so here I have for the first time in a decade, an opportunity to have a purely imaginary character. And, and I'll tell you, um, she's the reason I changed genres. She's single-handedly responsible for my sort of jumping ship and, and writing this suspense novel. I never, it never occurred to me that I might write one. And um, I never had the idea until I had the idea for this character, this missing persons detective who is, as you say, ob obsessed. She hears the stories of the missing like a siren song to her own detriment. And then like me, Anna grew up in foster care and her background and more than that, Sue, like what she carries, right? The freight that she carries makes her uniquely susceptible to the stories. And so she is a, a wounded healer, sort of always searching for those who need to be found. And the reason why is because she herself once needed to be found. I mean, it's sort of mm -hmm. that kind of tapestry. And um, along the way, as I was doing my research, I learned that there were a string of mostly unsolved abductions of children and, and teens in the same geographical area at the same in the same time frame as my novel is set and that was the impetus for including fact and once I decided to do it it felt profound that I do it that I tell the truth in this kind of stark way um, it also felt inevitable because it's what I've been doing, right? Blurring the line between fact and fiction in hopes of telling a truer version of both, if that makes any sense. I think it probably does make sense to you, yeah. given what you're, what you're up to as a novelist. Um, well, I think we shared both writing... Um historical fiction, taking women and trying to give them a voice and trying to find the, the correct or, or best, I should say, intersection between our imagination and the history being true to that, but also setting them free a little bit too. Free, exactly. Yeah. Exactly said, yeah. But I'm toasting you, by the way, with kombucha. <laughs> 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 Looks good. I wish I could yeah. reach out and get some. I know, right? Yeah. Well, Paula, I mean, we have to say this, being this literary historical novel writer and poet, 
changing a genre to a thriller, how much of a challenge was that? I mean, you said a minute ago, you know, I took a risk. Never occurred to me. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. So, like I said, it came out of nowhere. I was on a dog walk one day and I just got this character in my mind, the way ideas come, right? I'm sure it happens to you all the time. That's the kind of the joy of the imagination. Like it seems to have its own agenda. Like we don't, you know, we don't, these, these things sort of just appear like, you know, like fairies or, you know, it feels like a magic carpet ride sometimes. Sometimes I say it's like going to the movies, you know, where I'll just have this idea. Well, this time it was a character. It was a character and her and her woundedness and her her resolve, really, was what's was so fascinating to me. And then I knew immediately where it needed to be set. Hmm. Well, so let's talk have, about the setting. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 let's talk about the setting for a minute. I know I'm jumping around a lot, but I get kind of excited and I do that. But um, well, I love yeah. to hear you talk about it. It's it's so hard to take something as large as a novel and distill it down to words in an hour. <laughs> so oh. I relate to that. Yeah, um, for but sure. I wanted to ask you about Mendocino. I've never been there. I have a feeling there's going to be an uptick in tourists to Mendocino. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's yeah. I mean the to me the setting was 1993 Mendocino right. California and it was this very atmospheric place is a great way to describe it and I thought your writing about nature about the ocean about the woods the forest was exquisite. Um, now you've spent time, you've lived, I think, in Mendocino for a time. Tell us why you said it there and how that works for you. Absolutely. So I live in Cleveland now, but I grew up in California. And so it's in my, I believe that wherever we are born kind of impresses itself on us as that that's our template. Um, and for beauty too. I mean, you know, Cleveland is striking and <laughs> in its way that was a joke um but california has always just been my place and i left it in my 20s and this was my opportunity to write a love letter to california mendocino if you've never been there is three hours north of san francisco and it's right on the rugged coastline so pacific highway highway one kind of runs north and it's jagged and wild and ferocious and the village of Mendocino is Victorian. So it's like white, you know, gingerbread houses and white picket fences, beautiful, stark, like pristine on a bluff above the roaring Pacific. And then right behind is the coastal range. So old growth redwood forests and fern forests and almost prehistoric looking, right, dense woodland. And then the fog comes in over all of it and it's like it is a dream you know and so when I had this idea for a character it came wedded to the setting and I just it just felt like it had a life of its own already but of course I was absolutely terrified like what do I know about writing suspense so I decided that what I was going to do is what I know how to do which is to focus on the character right because that's that's really our bread and butter isn't it like that's what we're interested in we're interested in these deep dives into character and getting to know whether it's a real woman or an imaginary woman um, the contours of the soul and at a certain point even if you're writing a historical the facts are going to fail you and you're going to have to let go and let your imagination and the subconscious do its work anyway. And so, yes, it was a risk, but no more of a risk than we take any time we put pen to paper. I think risk taking is um, important for writers, for fiction writers. You know, we love to play it safe as human beings, but as writers, I love to be, I love to challenge myself and I, 
love to take a risk. I certainly took one with this last book, but I think um, it energizes us as writers. And I could feel that in your work. You know, there was an energy of, because you had departed from what you had been doing so successfully and took off on this other route. And yet it works so wonderfully, but I felt like you really weren't playing it safe. You were taking it. <laughs> no, I suppose not. I mean, I think that we are kind of two of a kind in, in that way. I think there's a part of me that really does like being over my head mm -hmm. and throwing myself over a cliff. It happened with The Paris Wife. I had never thought I might write historical fiction, but the idea had such energy and such integrity all on its own that it kind of convinced me to go to go after it. And, and this time too, I just had that inkling that if I had the courage to follow this character into this realm and see what she had to teach me, I was gonna grow as a writer. And, you know, sometimes I think that the imagination has no ceiling. We box ourselves in by thinking, oh, I'm this kind of writer, or I can't do this, or I have to do that kind of book, or other people's expectations are what have you. If you throw all of that out and then align yourself with the pure, the pure notion of the idea, I don't think that you can go wrong. I mean, to me, that's, you know, that's a kind of prayer, right? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think when an idea comes as a writer, it's sort of something I like to play with and tuck kind of planted in my imagination and see what sprouts. And I have to be fascinated by it. And then it sometimes really takes root and grows into a story. Um, and as long as we follow that, we're usually on pretty good ground mm -hmm. rather than trying to fit ourselves into a mold, like you were saying. True. And I think you have to be fascinated because, you know, that's what most people who want to be a writer don't want to hear is that that countless hours, the thousands upon thousands of hours really spent thinking and stewing and writing and revising and editing and dreaming about these characters and then getting up to do it. Again, you have to be fascinated because if you weren't, right, you'd give up. So it's all out of love and obsession and where those two things meet, right? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have, well, I think it was C.J. Jung that said we, creativity is just playing with what we love. And I think there is some truth in that. Well, Beautiful. I underline a lot of passages in, in your novel. Thank you. And what, can I read one to you? I I would I think I would love it. <laughs> you will I'll love it. A minute. <laughs> I thought that this particular passage um, really goes to kind of like the heart of the story in a way, at least for okay. the character. She says, in a single day, a car ride with a social worker, her old family was erased, blotted out, and new parents appeared from nowhere. With the signing of some papers, her story had stopped and restarted. The girl she had been was depleted along with her birth name and all the rest of it. No matter how resilient children can be or how wanted and loved and nurtured they are by their new parents, the original wounds of abandonment and rejection aren't just magically healed. I've seen it. I've lived it. How anyone with a hole inside them will search on and on, sometimes all their lives for a way to fill it. Now, you said earlier that you had been in foster care and you've been really open and courageous about talking about your experience in um, foster care. You know, when I finished the book of longings, I gave it to my husband to read and he said, I see. Now I have to, I have to stop and say, my character's name, Anna too. <laughs> <laughs> Both have characters. So I think it's okay. I think people know that yours is, you know, the, the wife of Jesus and <laughs> mine's a missing persons detective. And so there. Yeah, I think they're not going to mix these two up. <laughs> like 2,000 years apart or something too. <laughs> um, but I love that they're both named Anna. 
And my husband said to me when he read it for the first time, he said, I see a lot of Anna in you and a lot of you in Anna. Mm. Can you tell us, is there some Anna in you? Are you in Anna? Yeah, for sure. And you know, it's so funny that you read that passage, Sue, because I was doing an event with Danny Shapiro the other night and she, um, at Wellesley Books, and she also read that same passage. So, really? Wow. Yes. And in fact, you are the only two who have done it and you chose the same passage. So I think that there's some some sort of radar that's happening or some sort of telegraphing. But so this is a moment where Anna is thinking and psychologizing um, about the victim, this missing girl who vanishes into thin air. She's 15 years old. She comes from an affluent family. They don't think she's a runner. So, but then Anna learns that she's adopted. And so Anna yes, has foster care in her background and knows that sense of abandonment and dislocation and uncertainty. She says, I, I know it, I've lived it, how anyone with a hole inside them will search on and on, perhaps all their lives for ways to fill it. So it's Anna's, what I said earlier, it's her freight, it's what she's carrying that helps her recognize and identify and in a deep way understand her victim who she's never met, right? It's just sort of leaving this almost like a luminescence, like a residue in the air behind her and she gets it. Like these are how these two stories intertwine, right? This is how Anna recognizes something profound about Cameron Curtis, but it's also how I recognize something profound about both of them. So it's my point of access. And honestly, Sue, it wasn't obvious to me when I began to write the book, when I just had that shimmer of a character and this shimmer of a setting that I was gonna go there, right? That I was going to give so much of my own story to Anna and to Cameron, my victim. And yet the stories seem to require it. And the deeper I got, the deeper it felt like everything was going. The novel seemed to have more um, heart and more soul and more significance. And my own fascination with the characters grew and my own investment with them grew because I wasn't just telling a a page turning mystery, right? It's it's a bigger story. It is about how we find each other in the dark, how we can help each other when we believe we're long past helping ourselves, you know, or you know, forgive each other when we believe we can't be forgiven. All kind of all of that is is packed in. Yeah, it's it's very layered. Just um, I, I underline so many things of different layers of this book. Um, well, there are many characters in the book besides Anna. I want to talk a moment about Hap. <laughs> Tell us about Hap because he's a figure that's extremely important. Where did he come from and what role does he have in Anna's life? You know, I'm not exactly sure where this character came from either. Um, Again, like my subconscious must have its own agenda. So Hap is Anna's foster father. She's 10 when she's, she arrives in Mendocino and she's placed with this couple. He is a, a forest ranger that's very high up. Um, and her foster mother is kind of a modern day mystic. So Hap and Eden are their names. And when she arrives, when Anna arrives, she's been bounced around a lot and she is hardened and she's, um, she's retreated inside of herself. She doesn't trust people and she doesn't believe that she can trust people anymore. And yet Hap, who is a survival expert, learns, mm, reads her right away, more like it, and understands that the way to talk to her is really 
survivor to survivor, that he knows all these survival skills that he's going to teach her how to build a fire, how to build a shelter, you know, how to take care of herself in the woods, how to read a trail, um, all of that as a way to give her a kind of competence, but also for Hap himself as a character. And he's really, he's really very special to me. He, in my head, he sounds like Sam Elliott, I guess, you know, he has this deep earned wisdom and uh, he believes that nature is medicine and it's something that he's going to give her as a gift that will be with her for the rest of her life really nature is medicine when you need it it's always there all of those skills that he taught her serve her well as a detective in this particular story i mean it's which brings me to ask you about the research for this book um i mean there are so many things you have to learn about how to drop clues and red herrings and <laughs> twists. I mean, you've got twists and surprises and clues. Are and you going to write a suspense novel next, Sue? <laughs> well, I wish I could do it. I know. <laughs> it was so yeah. fascinating to me how you pulled all that off so brilliantly. How hard was that? And does, do you think the story itself was, um, a poly class how did that figure into it do you think that was okay. another dimension you wanted to bring in with the research yeah okay so to start with for sure there was just a steep learning curve in the conventions of the genre which are completely different than anything I'd done before or ever thought to do before. Like you said, like planting clues and then unplanting them because they were, they were the wrong ones or red herrings or, you know, all of that. I've never had to like, just hint at the identity of a killer, but then make sure that there can be some heart pounding kind of, you know, conclusion between the antagonist and protagonist that then, feels inevitable, but was invisible until we get to that moment of inevitability. I think these are hard things to yeah. do. They're like really hard things to do, but that's just the structure. Like that's just the convention. And it did feel um, hugely exciting too, because as we've just said, like it can be really energizing to take a big risk and to try something new and to challenge yourself. It's like learning a language in your brain loves to learn a new language and starts firing on all cylinders. And that's how it felt when I was writing the book that I was learning an entirely new language and um, just having a stinking fun time doing it. But also eerie things happened. So I set the book in 1993 for logistical reasons, because I wanted to write character driven story and not a procedural so I wanted it to be pre DNA testing pre criminal profiling pre internet even and pre cell phones because it just becomes obnoxious right how characters learn things about each other and I just wanted to strip it all bare and make it this super simple like I said non procedural book so I said it in the 1990s and then once I did that it was already set in the fall right so I'm like okay fall of of 1990, I started to do some research to try to make Anna's voice have real kind of texture and authority and veracity so that she, I mean, she's an expert, right? She has to sound like she comes from this place of absolute authority. So I was listening to a podcast um, from the 1990s and it just happened to be in this really fluky way a podcast of the lead detective on the Polly Class case that he was uh, retired at the time. He is retired, just being interviewed by another FBI agent about the details of the case. And he said, which is true, Polly Class, who, um, and I'll tell you about it in a minute if you don't remember who she is, disappeared um, on, was kidnapped uh, in her childhood home in her bedroom in the middle of a slumber party while her two 12 year old friends watched on October 1st, 1993. So October 1st, 1993 is 10 days after my imaginary girl went missing 60 miles away. 
And when I learned that, it's just like, you know, it's one of those moments, like all the hairs kind of stood up on the back of my neck and it just felt not fluky at all. You know, click buttons and you go down rabbit holes and you start to do all this research, not knowing what that one thing is gonna be that's gonna be like a flare that goes off and changes everything, like changes the whole story and changes the entire direction of the story. And so that's what happened. Polyclos is probably the most well-known missing persons uh, child case in national history. It was the largest manhunt in the state of California. Thousands and thousands of people came out to search for her. And I weave it into the story. It becomes an opportunity for me to discuss things like why is it that some cases become national news overnight while others disappear without a trace, right? Why is that true? Um, and then I have Anna think about that. You know, why do some kids land on the milk carton and some aren't even reported? Yeah. Right? So once I decided to go there and to do this weaving of fact and fiction, it did start to feel, as I said before, almost like a sacred act to say the names of these victims because of what they experienced and to honor their lives and dignify their deaths and the suffering of their families. So um, kind of dark notion, and yet it's the truth. Well, right? it brought such an, uh, a believable and deeper dimension to the story, I thought. And you could play those two, Anna's case of the missing right. Cameron with this other poly class that's historically true. It yeah. was very interesting tension between them, I thought. Thank um, you. Well, it seems to me that, that one of the things that Anna, and we've talked a little bit about her background, about how she has this obsession and this absolute fascination that the, Voices of the Missing are like these siren songs and she can't help but listen to them. But part of it is that she's fascinated with all of it, the psychology of it, in the same way that you and I are fascinated by the psychology of characters. She's fascinated by the psychology of victims. Like, how does a victim become a victim anyway? Like, why Polly and not another girl? Why Cameron and not someone else? What is the... What is the hidden connection? What does a predator see about this girl as opposed to that girl? And it's to me a very poignant conversation because I'm a survivor of childhood trauma. And it was a question I always had when I was a kid, like, why me? Well, of course, I thought that um, I learned so much. I, I can't tell you how much I learned from reading your book, you know, I think you want as a novelist, I always want my books to enlighten someone, you know, I want them to learn something. Right. But I also mostly want them to be hit right in the heart. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I really want. I want to get them in the heart. Emotionally, but I, yes. Yeah, you do it both ways. I mean, we learn, we're enlightened. Um, we understand psychologically so much of what's going on and why, and it was like a deep dive into that, but you ultimately, you get us in the heart. And I loved that about the book. You. Um, you mentioned Eden. This is um, the mystic, mystical's foster mother of Anna. She's growing up, Hap's wife. Right. She said something in this book that stopped me cold. And when I, I think it was a very provocative statement and I want to repeat it and have you tell us a little bit about it. Um, when I read it, here's the feeling I got. It okay. felt like suddenly she had gathered up this story and blessed it. That's mm. how it felt to me. Mm. What she said was getting your heart broken. <laughs> is the privilege, the privilege of, being, of being, human. being human. Getting your heart broken is the privilege of being human. Go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank I you. I feel like you just blessed me in the book too. Um, 
you know how it is though, Sue, like there are those lines. I mean, I've underlined half of Book of Longings. These lines are, it's what we think and feel, but it's also a surprise when we arrive at them on the page. Like, of course, I don't know Eden is going to say this to Anna. I'm just writing the scene. I'm in the dialogue there. You know, you're just listening, right? You're listening to these characters talk to one another. And if you are deep in the character and you know how they think and feel and how they live, right? What their, what their, their philosophy is, what drives them, what their anchor points are, then they're gonna tell the truth to each other. And this is something, just one of those moments. It's also my truth, right? This is what I believe. And, and of course, the, the shame is we spend most of our lives trying to avoid getting our heart broken. Right, and to think, think of it as a privilege, get us through. Mm -hmm. you know? instead but, of a privilege, right? But it's not, it's also inevitable, <laughs> you know, and right. it felt true to me too when I read that, it, it rang you. really true. I'm glad you liked her. I, I love that character. I love the Eden character and she really, I think of Hap and Eden as these two kind of two compass points, right? Mm. That one is the one is sort of this strong attachment to nature and the other is this much more mystical, um, ethereal, and even, uh, you know, it's not religious, but it is the language, Eden knows the language of the soul. Yeah, well, it's also, you know, a garden. <laughs> and I, th I thought of her as, and sometimes oh, I couldn't help but have I that. I didn't think about that. Oh, what a beautiful, <laughs> Reading, you can write the Sparks notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was kind of like um, Anna's geographical presence of a Garden of Eden. Yeah. You know, she was kind of like that. And I liked her. I also loved Tally. It was Tally, right? Yes. Yeah, Tally is the, um, the psychic. So it is true that in a lot of missing persons cases, and maybe you'll be surprised to know this, a lot of missing persons cases do rely on information from psychics. They don't maybe rely on it, but sometimes psychics, for instance, will contact the FBI or a police department or a sheriff's department with information. And, and I kept coming across this as, as a theme in cases. And I just thought, well, maybe it was time for me to have a psychic in this story. And um, what I really love about Tally as a character is she doesn't solve anything, right? She doesn't step in to like tell Anna where to look or give her some important clue that she couldn't learn for herself. If anything, she's a kind of therapist in the book. And even more, what she does is she tells Anna or shows her rather how to trust her intuition, her instinct, her, her gut feelings, and, you know, she, it's like a deep sounding. She tells her to trust herself. Yeah, she seems to think, and I felt she was a wise woman. She's a llama raising wise woman. <laughs> Alpacas. I like that she raises llamas. There's even yeah. a, a birth scene of a llama that was pretty compelling. Oh, thank you. Yeah, but she seems to think that um, honesty and love is a healing thing. Mm. Who would think? Yeah. <laughs> Who would imagine? Yeah, and she has a lot to say about mm. forgiveness, self-forgiveness and self-rescue. And she sees right away that Anna is, is carrying a lot and she won't let herself off the hook. Yeah, she seems to look into her and see what others may not see and what Anna needs. And right. maybe more so than her therapist in the high rise in San Francisco, right? Yeah. So yes, there's therapists there are um, that make a cameo role in the plot. And, you know, again, as someone who I, I personally have spent a lifetime's worth of work on my own healing from my childhood. And so it seemed natural because this book was really starting to take on this texture um, and being about, a lot of it seemed to point in and in at what it means to heal from significant trauma. 
can we do it? And if we can, how do we do it, right? So this was a question that kept kind of weaving throughout the book. And so I have given the book um, language from some of my therapists in the past. And there it's trauma therapists that I've worked with um, somehow managed to knit their way into this book, which is why this book is more personal than any book I've ever written, mm -hmm. including the memoir that I published about my experiences of growing up in foster care, because I'm, you know, I'm older, I've had more experiences myself, and I have more wisdom as well. And so it's all kind of in there. It's yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. Before we get to audience questions, I, I really want to know something about the sculptures of Time and the Maiden. Oh, yeah. Now, they, they kind of bookend the book that you start with them and they turn up at the end and they float all the way through. There they are. Yeah. yeah. And there were some beautiful graphics in the book. In the book. Yeah. So well, let's about the mystery yeah. and the meaning of these sculptures. Yeah. So um, in the real town of Mendocino, which looks a lot like the fictional town of Mendocino in my book, including all of the places, the grocery store, the coffee shop, the, the cafe, it's all kind of there, all the street names and the cemeteries and it's all there. But the Masonic Lodge, which is now a credit union in downtown Mendocino, um, has this sculpture, um, a carving that has been there since 1865. And these figures, Time and the Maiden, it's Father Time uh, with the scythe and he's got his wings there and he's braiding the hair mm -hmm. of the girl in front of him. And there are eerie other images. There's an hourglass and an urn and a, she's reading a, a book and she's got an acacia branch in her hand. And all of it, as I say in the book, is like a puzzle, a mystery in plain sight. And nobody in town knows what any of these things mean. Maybe the carver didn't even know what they meant. I mean, there are symbols that have something to do with um, rituals, Masonic rituals, but more than this, they're just there and they're so striking and you can't look away from them. And they're, they're just like that stark white against the crisp the sky and how can I not put that in a book like it had to be it had to be in well, the book and I just thought we're so symbolic I felt like you pulled the symbolism out for me at the end of the story and I understood something suddenly it was like oh that's <laughs> what the maiden is okay <laughs> and you know time is always important in these cases too missing right. children missing girls and absolutely but of course mother. father father time is also is also death yeah. right so yeah. death, death so there's a lot of a lot of interesting symbolism in all of that well i think we should probably see what audience questions we have now, I haven't done this before, so we're going to have an interesting time. Okay. Hi, Paula. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, this is, all right. Is that it? <laughs> That's it. Hi, Paula. All right, no. Acronite here. Does living in Cleveland influence or inspire your fiction writing? <laughs> well, I know Mendocino did. Does Cleveland? If living in Cleveland inspired my fiction writing. Um, wow. I don't, I don't think literally so. And yet, you know how it is when you're working on a book, So, When you're deep into it, how everything seems to belong to the book, right? Everything you overhear, little bits of conversation in a coffee shop or what have you, or something you see on the street, and suddenly that's in the book too. So it just so happens that anything I might walk by, uh, a tree in bloom or something, and my mind kind of takes a picture of that, then of course that's going to appear in the book. I've been living in Cleveland now 
for 17 years. So Cleveland, whether I want it to be or not, is definitely in my work. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, we you're right. We pick up everything through osmosis, our surroundings. Right. Um, I love Mendocino. This is from Cher Davidson. I love Mendocino, California, and I'm looking forward to reading Paula's book. I lived in Ferndale, also an amazing California Victorian village on the same coast a bit further north. I relate so much to Paula as I am also writing for the first time. She wants to know if your story, I'd like to ask if your story is in first person or third and why you chose that voice. Okay. Um, so my story is in first person and all my books are in first person because that's my sweet spot like that's how I put on the role of the character and sometimes it feels very much like it is a role like I'm an actress and I'm climbing inside that I don't know if it feels this way to you sometimes too like climbing into the character and sort of looking out their eyes and seeing the world. When I was a graduate student at the University of Michigan, um, the writer Ethan Kanan came in and just gave a guest talk. And he talked about why he chose the first person so much. And it was that, it was about closing the distance between the narrator and the subject, right? That it all becomes kind of one thing. And I, that's what I'm always trying to do is just to get closer and closer and closer to what it is that I'm looking at and trying to wrestle with as subject matter. So do you have a preference? You like first person too, don't you? I do. I've written every novel in first person and I agree with you. It, it gives me an empathetic experience of the character that's deeper than anything I can get any other way. I mean, I tell myself I'm going to write in third person this time, but I can't do it. <laughs> I want to drop I that into too. that character. I know I've done that too. And I've even tried and I don't know why I've tried almost like because, because it doesn't come naturally or something. I think I should manage to make it work, but um, it does feel, it does feel right. And it feels like a, a, a marriage between, you know, like my historical novels. And I'm sure you would say, Anna's voice, if there is a real Anna, like is not, is not the real character from history. It's an amalgamation between your voice and her voice. You know, Hadley's voice and the Paris wife is not the real Hadley. How could she be? It's a place where my voice meets her voice in this mysterious realm and finds a way to tell a deeper truth about the human experience like that's what we're doing yeah the first person just works for me better all right you wrote two books on Hemingway is there another book in the works for Anna and Will <laughs> is Anna finished that is, Anna a great got more? Question. that is a great question so Anna's my main character and Will is a childhood friend of hers from her Mendes er, early Mendocino days, and he's now the town sheriff. And there's there's a there's a romantic tension between the two, which I like. I think Will is in my imagination. Will is hot, so I don't know if he was hot for you, Sue, but he was hot for me. Um, I like to think that maybe there is another book. For Anna and Will. I don't know that for sure because we never really know what's coming for us as artists, writers. But I can tell you that I'm very, very invested in these characters and in this world. And even some of the minor characters, or like you mentioned, Tally, or you know, the homeless couple in the park, or the wisecracking bartender, Wanda, these characters feel very, um, they feel like real people to me. And I'd like to spend a little more time with them. We'll see. I think your readers will too want to spend some more time with them, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right, here's one. Um, how has living in the time of COVID-19 yeah. influenced your writing and doing a book tour? 
Well, well we answer something about that, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Um, I would love to hear you answer that question too, Sue, about your writing routine. So when I was working on The Paris Wife, my kids were really small and I never had any time to myself or space or, you know, a shower. Um, and so I would write in a coffee shop near my house, a Starbucks actually. And now that I've made it, I have my own beautiful office with bookcases that look a lot like yours actually, Sue. Mm -hmm. Um, but I work at home and that's a beautiful thing when my kids go to school, they're now 14 and 16. Um, and this past year has been really difficult because a lot of that time they were home and I don't, I can't compartmentalize. So it's not as if they're out there and I can just shut my door and not so pay attention to them. It was really difficult. You know, I would hear them in the kitchen and I would just sort of have to go and see what they were doing or, and to try to, I don't know, just be a mom, I guess. Um, so that part was really challenging for me. And I, I don't think I've figured it out. I mean, hope, gladly now I'm doing this instead of writing, but how has your writing routine changed with COVID, Sue? Well, mostly I feel like I've spent since last April when the Book of Longings came out, I've spent that time doing the world's longest book tour virtually. That's how I feel. <laughs> it went for a long time, but it was incredible. I mean, we had, we were inventing as we went because my book came out just about the time that all the bookstores closed and, you know, it really hit hard and we had to sort of, who was it? Sartre said, genius is how we invent in desperate situations. I felt like my publisher was a genius trying to, uh, you know, figure, figure it out, out on the fly. Yeah. But the virtual events worked wonderfully. I was skeptical because I love engaging with the readers. And, um, but I found that you could do that really in some way virtually. And it did have its perks. I mean, like right now I've got on my bedroom shoes, you know. Have, <laughs> and you get to sleep in your own in your own bed tonight yeah, and you, yeah so it has perks and it has drawbacks it what i miss is and though we complain about going out on tour and and travel and hotels and how exhausting it is what i miss is just looking out and seeing faces and then talking to people and and when they, you know, get their book signed or whatever, hearing a little, a moment of their story and why they left home to come out to an author event. And so that all that is gone, but what's here that has never really been here before is this, yeah. like this humane thing of putting us in conversation with each other. And we, I don't know, I, I find this to be a surprising gift for a book tour, just have these rich conversations with like-minded people and writers that I admire so much. This is a total gift, I love it. Yeah, it has lots of advantages, but I'm, I feel the same way you do. I miss the face in front of me and having that moment with the reader and hearing what they have to say. It's, mm -hmm. you can't really replace that. Right. but it's, it's worked in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you, there, there were three things that turned up in this story that I love. I mean, really love. Jane Eyre, <laughs> the poetry of Rilke, Rilke. <laughs> and Cricket the dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those three things- You're adorable. Are wonderful. How did they end up, because you love them too? How did they end up in there? What do you think? That you love them too. <laughs> that I love them too. Because Jane Eyre is just one of those, you know, I, I believe Sue, no matter what book I'm writing, that I'm always writing about resilience. And Jane Eyre is just one of my favorite characters from literature. I was an orphan, she was an orphan. You know, I set my sights on people in books. I was always looking for a way through by attaching to characters and books. I was a reader when I was a kid. I would hide in the library and sort of tuck myself into the stacks in order to disappear. 
and then reappear in these stories. So yes, I love Jane Eyre. I love the poetry of Rilke, who I read um, often, if not daily. And Cricket the dog is a real dog. Cricket is a dog that comes along in the story to kind of save Anna and to teach her that she does need help from others. Um, and it softens her and opens her to love again um, and to trust too. And Cricket is a dog that I met when I was working on the book. And I looked into Cricket's eyes and I told her I was gonna put her in a book. I didn't yet know how she would appear in that book, but um, yeah, I think dogs make everything better. My dog makes everything better, so yeah. yeah my dog too but i i'm not over that gripping scene that you wrote <laughs> i will no spoilers here folks but there is a gripping scene and the dog cricket i but i will say that no animals are hurt in the telling of this story the making of this story <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness but it was uh, scene that was you know which one i'm talking about i'm sure <laughs> Um, let's see, we have another question here. Um, Paula, do you think this new book is the book of your heart, perhaps more so than your previous books? What, what do you have to say about that? Is it the book of my heart? Yeah, maybe. I think something really extraordinary happened. And I know we're almost out of time, but I, I feel like I need to say today, because I was listening tonight to a podcast that my dear friend, uh, Patty Callahan Henry had recommended to me. We were talking today and she's like, oh my goodness, the latest Krista Tippett is about this guy who does the theater of war. He basically takes plays from antiquity and he brings them into current settings, into you know, stadiums and, and theaters and these Greek plays, you know, the classics, Oedipus the King, and and as a way to um, invite conversation for some of the deeper stories that are happening in our current moment. And he said this really profound thing. I've always hated the word catharsis too. People always say, do you feel like writing the book was cathartic to you? And I always say no, because I think, well, catharsis means to purge and, I, and I'm not trying to get rid of anything. I'm trying to take a deeper view. But he said this profound thing which is a long way of answering, yes, this is the book of my heart. He said, when people are exposed to tragedy, like Greek tragedy, it's you know extreme. It's like these big stories, profound stories. And they're exposed to them. They might be more open to telling part of their own story. And when they tell part of their own story, they help others because others feel less alone. And when they help those others who feel less alone, they themselves are healed. And that's really what happens with catharsis. And so as I found my way into this story, and closer and closer to the truth that I wanted to tell, something was set free for me, for sure but it was because I meant to help others by writing the book. So beautiful. that's really a beautiful sentiment. Catharsis. I think that stories, when we tell a story, it in, evokes the stories of others. And that's one of the powers of story. It also evokes empathy, which is a very good reason to write. Yeah. To give I people Right? It's why we tell these stories. It's why we're here. And that bearing witness, right, to the human condition, like what we're doing here, is, um, is uh, it's kind of can be a kind of profound and holy act. And I love my work. I love that we're here together having significant conversations about what it means to be human. Thank you, Sue. Well, thank you so much, Paula, for letting me be in conversation about this wonderful new book. Thank you. So here's someone from PALS to say goodnight, I think. 
Yes, uh, I just wanted to thank you again, Paula, Sue. Such a great conversation. A reminder to everyone uh, to purchase the book, Paula's book, Sue's book that just came out in paperback. The most beautiful cover on a book I have ever, ever seen. I just have to say This that. is pretty great too. <laughs> it's not bad, uh -huh. it's not bad. Thank you. Yeah, and if if uh, if anyone wants to rewatch or share this event with people, uh, make sure to check out our YouTube uh, channel uh, that should be posting sometime tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, Paula, Sue, and everyone else, thank you so much, and uh, we wish you have a, a really beautiful evening. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Good, good night. Good night.